Welcome back to North Texas and Focus. My guest on the program today is Mark Lawrence, the director of the Lyndon Baines Johnson Presidential Library and Museum. Mark Lawrence, thank you so much for joining the program. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So let's start with this. And I, I think this is the basic question. What does a director of a presidential library do? <laughs> That's a great question. And you know, honestly, I don't have a single answer to that. It depends on the day. And that speaks to the complicated institution that the LBJ Library is. We have um, at the very core of our operation an archive of 45 million pages. So sometimes my responsibilities uh, entail managing all that material, making decisions about um, what should be released and you know how our researchers should be um, should be welcomed and and um, and and, and um, uh, how we can how we can best serve uh, those people who come in come through our doors to do research into the history of the Johnson administration or the or the or Lyndon Johnson's longer career. We also have a museum, so sometimes my responsibilities entail temporary exhibits and uh, questions related to visitors coming through our doors to see the museum. And we have an education program and we also have a very complicated and old building. So sometimes I'm tied up with uh, thinking about repair projects. And we're doing this interview because it's been 50 years since President Johnson passed. Uh, but I wanted to ask about that specifically. Is your job a little easier because the president um, you know, that your library represents is long dead. Whereas, you know, if it was the Bush or the Obama library, something like that, and you know, you will, the person's mm -hmm. alive, they might want to soothe out some of the warts. Is it right. easier of <laughs> working for, so to speak, a long dead president? Yeah, probably on balance. I mean, I think it cuts both ways. Clearly the Obama library or the, the Bush library uh, up in Dallas um, benefits from having a living ex-president who can take part in their activities and kind of draw attention to the institution. But I totally get what you're driving at. And it is certainly true that as time passes, we get a little more critical distance from the history at the heart of our of our library. And I think that's very helpful to give our, you know, our visitors a kind of fair and balanced um, understanding of the Johnson presidency based on the best scholarship, which now, you know, has been uh, 50 years in the making. And 50 years um, in the making, 50 years after his death, what should uh, what should people today uh, know about him, remember about him, the, the core things? Well, I, I mean, I think that over the years, Lyndon Johnson's legacy has been very much shrouded by the Vietnam War. And I will say this, I think that is absolutely part of his legacy and something that needs to be understood and um, needs to be reckoned with as part of his legacy. But I think with the passage of time, we all also have come to realize as a society more and more that there's more to Lyndon Johnson than just the um, the, the unfortunate decisions that led to uh, this disastrous conflict in, in Southeast Asia. Lyndon Johnson presided over what is one of the most remarkable programs of domestic reform in all of American history by some measures trailing only the New Deal for the ambition and scope of the domestic um, uh, legislation that Lyndon Johnson signed into law. This, of course, encompasses civil rights. It encompasses the war on poverty. It encompasses environmental legislation, education, Medicare and Medicaid, the National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities, public broadcasting, and so many more uh, pieces of what Lyndon Johnson called the great society that he aimed to establish. And he got all of those things done because um, his reputation was that he was a master negotiator, um, a great compromiser, um, in this era of partisan discord, is there anything about his legacy that we should use as a, you know, a North Star to solve our current political divisions? Well, I think that Lyndon Johnson does offer some lessons for the present moment. He was fundamentally a problem solver. I think he was very pragmatic in his approach to politics. Sometimes I think we uh, unfortunately and incorrectly think of him as an ideologue because he's so closely associated with this ambitious program of liberal reform. Um, and I, I wouldn't want to take anything away from the ambition of his, of his domestic agenda. But fundamentally, I think what Lyndon Johnson was all about was identifying problems and then figuring out how to solve them. And he was very ecumenical in how he went about that task. He worked across the aisle with Republicans. He he um, he he worked with uh, factions of his own party against other factions of his own party uh, to build coalitions, an 
ever shifting array of coalitions to support the legislation that he championed. So there was this really, there was this pragmatic streak about Lyndon Johnson, I think that um, is sadly missing from our own political era and something that we could probably all use a little bit more of in 2023. And one thing uh, personally for me, I was interested in uh, when I visited the library was the Johnson treatment, um, his famous, you know, badgering and cajoling political allies and enemies. Um, I've read some books since then that say the Johnson treatment is a, a bit overstated. So if I'm talking to the director <laughs> of his library, uh, what do you think? Is the Johnson treatment, is that a, is that a real thing? Well, it, it is a real thing. I think there's absolutely no question about that. Lyndon Johnson was a master of persuading particularly members of Congress to get on his program. And he used famously an array of flattery, of quid pro quos, of threats, of arm twisting um, to, 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 to bend other people to, to his will. And I do think that this is one explanation for the remarkable effectiveness he had, especially in working with, with Congress during, during his presidency, and for that matter, when he was a member of Congress in earlier periods. But I, I do think there is something to the idea that it's been exaggerated. I mean, one of the things that's maybe hardest to get our heads around in 2023, given the polarization of our politics, is that um, politics was much more fluid back then. And there were coalitions that were available to Lyndon Johnson on a whole array of reform projects. And so in some ways he was pushing on an open door, as I sometimes like to say, in, um, in, in trying to convince other people to get uh, behind his reform program. This was a period, the early and mid 1960s, when lots and lots of Americans, including in the Republican party, very much uh, supported the same ideas. So his job was really to find the coalitions, to put them together, but those coalitions were there for, for the making. And, um, and and that's an important difference, I think, between now and then. And of course, he he fine tuned those uh, coalition building skills as a, a representative from Texas, then as a senator from Texas. Um, we know that only two presidents were born in Texas, and only you know Eisenhower was really a Kansan at heart. So only Come one on. of them claimed Texas. Um, how important is that? Do you think to to folks that visit the library? Um, his Texas roots. I mean, I, I think for many of our visitors, it is an important part of who he was. I think people are drawn to Lyndon Johnson because of this sense that he was this larger than life, um, you know, uh, Texas figure who was who thought big, who was personally big, who created a very big presidential life. Library. I mean, he really, in many ways, I think, embodied Texas in ways that people find really, really, um, really, you know, really, really uh, appealing. And this one is a little bit out of left field, but I wonder, um, with all the hoopla in the news about classified documents, I wonder if presidential libraries have had to deal with any of that at all. Um, you know, people double checking what, what's in here. What, what do we have in here? Well, I mean, for sure, the question has been asked of the LBJ library. I'm sure it's been asked of every other presidential library. Um, you know, the, the controversies are much more likely to swirl around the more recent presidential libraries. I mean, our material, of course, has been under our roof for, in most cases, decades. It's true, we get uh, small amounts of new material from time to time. But, uh, you know, uh, classified material, the really sensitive material that's at the heart of this uh, recent controversy um, is, you know, has been uh, under under our roof for a long time and is is pretty securely uh, uh, stowed away if it still needs to be classified. And there are very uh, robust procedures for reviewing that material in order to make it available to the American people. So um, certainly not to make light of the controversy, it's an important issue. But fortunately, if you go back 50 years, the, the questions are not terribly um, urgent and there aren't too many problems to focus on. And that probably cuts to the side of it's easier um, working for a long dead president, of course. I think that that's, that's fair to say. Absolutely. Um, we you talked about the robust domestic agenda um, that Lyndon Johnson produced as president and in the Senate. Um, you, you also mentioned that Vietnam has defined large parts of his legacy. Um, fifty years, um, fifty years later, I, I wonder: uh, Do you think Johnson 
was a great president, a top tier president? Yeah, that is such a difficult question to answer because there are these two dimensions of his legacy that are really hard to reconcile. On the one hand, he was this, you know, master of the legislative process who had big ideas and managed to sign so many transformative laws into effect, many of which, you know, continue to shape American society to this day. And yet, indisputably, he is also the president who made a series of what turned out to be pretty catastrophic decisions with respect to, to Vietnam. So, how, you know, at the end of the day, what do we do with that? How do we balance these two dimensions of, of Lyndon Johnson? And I will tell you that, in the view of many historians, you know, there are these uh, surveys of presidential historians that are written about from time to time. He he kind of falls in that second tier, uh, the, say the second 10 of the, of the 46 presidents. And I think this is probably about right. It gives him a whole lot of credit for the remarkable legislation that came about under his presidency, but also knocks him down several pegs, I think, for the, for the, the Vietnam War. I think reasonable people could probably argue that he belongs higher and other people could certainly belong that uh, argue that he belongs lower because of the cataclysm that was Vietnam. But I think th the way a lot of historians have thought about this question strikes me as, as about right. Um, he probably winds up in that, you know, somewhere between between 10 and 20. If, if you did it sports style, that, that's what I saw. Somewhere between <laughs> eight and 17 was the number <laughs> exactly. I had in my head. Exactly, um, exactly. I know it's hard to ask a, a historian about modern day politics, but I wonder if you see any Johnson-esque traits in the current president. I really do. Um, you know, there are striking parallels for one thing in their biographies, right? These are longtime members of Congress who have a reputation for bipartisanship and problem solving. They're not seen, I think, as particularly ideological figures who tried and failed to get the presidential nomination more than once before they were added to the ticket headed by a more charismatic, younger individual, JFK in LBJ's case and Barack Obama in Joe Biden's case. And then in different ways, obviously, they rose finally um, to, to the presidency. But I think this 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 fact that they were both um uh these these kind of older figures who hitched themselves to the charismatic young more politically dynamic figure is a really striking similarity um but between them and i think both of them you know when they got to the presidency really aspired to make a major uh, contribution in domestic legislation. They both really wanted this to be their principal legacy. Lyndon Johnson with his great society and Joe Biden with a whole array of big, bold legislative uh, initiatives, uh, the Build Back Better program in particular from 2021. Um, so I think there, there's something about their desire to um, really leave a, a strong legacy on the domestic side that's very similar uh, in comparing the two figures. And before I get to my final question, um, when I visited the LBJ Library in 2015, um, I was very impressed. Um, you know, I, I thought the history, the telling of the history was good. It was, um, you, you know, if you go to someone's presidential library, you might expect stuff to be fanned over. But I thought it was critical. I thought it was good. I thought it was informative. Um, of course, this station is uh, this show is hosted on a college radio station. Hmm. Um, if you uh, had a pitch for the young people that are listening to come visit the library. Uh, what would that be? <laughs> I really appreciate that. I would say um, come visit us because we are a dynamic, um, exciting institution that through its museum, through its archive, and through its public programming is really doing a lot of important work that that deserves everyone's attention, very much including younger people. I think you are probably correct in implying that presidential libraries generally, you know, appeal to an older demographic. You know, people out there traveling the museum circuit tend to be people with more time on their hands, probably resources. They're probably a little further along in life. 
But I will tell you, just for example, in the last few weeks, we've had education programs that are aimed at teachers and, in some cases, students to uh, familiarize them with the Johnson period. And part of that is to demonstrate that how relevant the Johnson presidency is to, um, to our own America in the 21st century for some of the reasons that we've just been talking about. We have wonderful public programs. Just last week, we had the director of national intelligence, who's this dynamic, uh, remarkably young woman named Avril Haynes, um, who came and sat on our big stage with a thousand people. And it was really a pleasure to me to see so many young people, University of Texas students, for the most part, filling up uh, much of the of, of the auditorium. So come and see us for those reasons. Come and see us to do research uh, for those research papers that maybe you're working on for your history or government classes. We have uh, a, a lot of wonderful material uh, to share with you. And for me, when, when I was a very young person, it was my grandmother who really um, lit a lifelong love of history inside of me. And so with that in mind, um, I usually don't do this, but I allowed her to submit a question um, so my final question comes from my grandmother, and she <laughs> wants to know, what about President Johnson's legacy on the advancement of civil rights stands out the most to you? Um, I yeah. Wow, I, I really appreciate that question. And it's a tough question to answer only because there are so many possible ways to attack it. But, but I will say this, Here, here's the... The, the thing that I think impresses me most. I think Lyndon Johnson saw, I think Lyndon Johnson understood that American demographics and American politics were changing in the 1950s and 1960s in ways that made it important for the Democratic Party to hitch itself to civil rights. So, you know, it, it, in, in advancing that agenda, he was doing things that he believed would be good for himself and for the party in a very practical way. But that said, I think Lyndon Johnson took risks to push an agenda where there really were um, potential dangers for his own prospects for re-election for the party. And above all, the 1964 um, Civil Rights Act was a risky move for Lyndon Johnson. We forget sometimes that he pushed this legislation before he came before the voters in the 1964 presidential election. He had good reason to worry that this legislation would sour particularly white voters in the South on him, and yet he moved forward anyway. So Lyndon Johnson was a pragmatist. He was politically shrewd, but he also was a man with a genuine sense of compassion who took serious risks to advance a cause that he believed in. It's a great answer. And I hope now that she got a question and I could convince my grandma to listen to my radio show. Um, Mark Lawrence, thank you so much for joining the program today. Thank you, Matthew. It's wonderful to be with you.